Welcome to the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs Daily War Room Briefing. We are at day number 29 of the war with Gaza. It may even be 30, I think, um, 29, 30. It's one of those two. It's been a very long time since the 7th of October um, and the massacre of 1,400 people and uh, the, the, the injuring of another 5,200 and the kidnapping now of 242 people, as has already been confirmed. Um, we're talking about a war that has started um, with the Gaza, the terrorists in Gaza, led by Hamas, ISIS, and uh, um, with the other um, Gazan terrorist groups, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. Um, and really, there's about a dozen of these terrorist organizations running around. Today, I'm uh, joined uh, uh, um, with my colleague and friend uh, Khalid Abu Tuama, um, a journalist and an Arab affairs uh, uh, expert. Um, who really is going to give us a tremendous insight into what's going on both in Gaza and a little bit round uh, regionally. Um, we're going to focus on the subject of uh, of this humanitarian ceasefire that's been uh, uh, thrown around a little bit. And also, obviously, we'll talk about uh, um, the speech of Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, on uh, Friday. Um, that's the update generally. Um, uh, the IDF is continuing its ground forces and uh, with its ground forces on uh, acting on the ground in Gaza um, now having completely cut off the, the, the city of Gaza um, from the north and the south and are operating um, to kill as many terrorists there as possible and to working to save as many of the hostages. Also, there are two main goals of the of the operation, obviously, for Israel. One, to get rid of the terrorists and two, to save the hostages. Um, so that's on, on the one hand, the terrorists themselves keep on firing uh, rockets into Israel We've seen over 9,000 rockets launched into Israel over the last uh, uh, period since the, the morning of the 7th of October. And uh, uh, those rockets keep continue on firing long range rockets also. Um, for, the, for the first time on, uh, on Saturday, we saw a long range rocket fired by Gaza, uh, by the Gazan terrorists towards Eilat. Um, this is a, a, a new distance that they haven't really covered before. Um, and is also one of the more dangerous uh, developments of the recent uh, uh, days. Um, we're seeing also on our northern border with uh, uh, Hezbollah continued tensions, continued tit for tat, continued attempts to uh, fire anti tank missiles and rockets into Israel by Hezbollah and uh, um, Israel responding. To date, we've uh, uh, managed to uh, uh, eliminate 60 Hezbollah terrorists um, on that northern uh, uh, front. Um, as they continuously try to challenge uh, uh, Israel and just to disrupt uh, our daily life. Um, hundreds of thousands of Israelis that are literally refugees within our own country, um, wandering around uh, 130,000 um, from the, the southern area and, uh, um, and another 100-odd thousand um, from the northern area. That's something that we're also dealing with internally. Jiran Samaria. The war with the terrorists there is continuing on. Hamas also has a, a great presence in Judea and Samaria. Um, and so that constant friction there and that constant desire of Iran, its proxies, Hamas, to carry out uh, uh, more terrorist attacks. Within Israel, we're seeing quiet, um, obviously, from the Israeli Arab population. Um, there were some concerns initially, but that has really been uh, uh, stamped out completely. And nothing, and, and we've seen the Israeli Arab population, it has to be said uh, uh, to their credit in many cases, um, standing side by side uh, with the Israelis, with the, the Israeli victims. A story that I heard over the weekend of, of, a, uh, um, of a bicycle shop owner in Mum al Fakhin who heard about the disasters of the, of the South, decided to load his van with 50 uh, uh, um, bicycles and send them off as a, uh, as a gift to the, the, the children who had been evacuated. His store was unfortunately then torched uh, um, soon afterwards. Um, but I think we're seeing a much closer relationship with uh, also with the, the Israeli Arab population. Also in Jerusalem, we saw on Friday um, prayers on the Temple Mount continuing on unaffected with no disturbances or may, definitely no major disturbances um, being registered. That's always been a source of friction, right, Khalid? Yeah. Um, and that could be one of those areas that... Uh, um, that really uh, uh, could uh, could either give us the path to internal peace or uh, um, or also be um, a subject for conflict. And so, uh, and you know, I think Maureen, been... we still haven't talked about the uh, Arabs who were uh, 
victims of the Hamas massacre on October 7th. Yeah, and many there victims. Were dozens of them. We haven't talked about the Arab Israelis who were kidnapped by Hamas. There are, Hamas is holding some Israeli Arabs. And we haven't talked about the Arabs, the Arab Israelis who rescued many Jews, so one, uh, especially from that music. Uh, I concert. think one of these broadcasts, Khaled, should be really yeah. devoted to the the, uh, the Israeli Arab population yeah. that were there were there were in, entire families killed uh, um, by 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 rockets falling on them. Um, there were many Israeli Arabs and Israeli Arab doctor who was on his way to his shift who uh, uh, stopped to help someone a stander by and was then murdered. Um, and another Israeli Arab who who left one of the safe areas, one of these uh, uh, b- a- 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 miguniot, uh, um, a- a- a fortified concrete areas, and um, that are placed around yeah. um, the uh, the festival. Who left there, left the area, even though with a, with a group of Jews inside, so went outside and said in Arabic, "The people inside there are my family." Really risking his own life um, to save uh, to save a, a-, a Jew. Really amazing, amazing scenes of heroism, you know, yeah. which which have to be discussed and remembered. We also saw that uh, disturbing footage of a, an, a young Arab man from uh, East Jerusalem who is captured by Hamas at the uh, music concert, and he tells them, "I'm Arab," and they and they shoot they, him. they 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 tell him, "Oh, you are a Jerusalemite, Magdisi," and they pass him from one to another, and then he's shot. Yeah, and this is you know an Arab Muslim from East Jerusalem. These guys came to kill. They, they did not distinguish between a Jew or an Arab. Uh, they even killed pets. They killed dogs. They killed. Uh, yeah. uh, they killed everything. Yeah. And that really brings us into the to the subject that uh, that I think we uh, uh, um, we would like to discuss and talk about more. The, the The title of today's discussion was how the humanitarian ceasefire would bolster Hamas, and really that's what we were talking about. How can we understand these calls for the humanitarian ceasefire on the one hand. On the other hand, obviously Israel, as we've said over and over again, Israel has nothing, has no beef with the, with the innocent Palestinians. We, we are interested in their security and safety just as much as, uh, as they are and as the rest of the world is. Our complaint, our fight is with Hamas and the terrorists. Yeah. So, so how do we really bre- make a bridge between those two things? Khalid? You know, Morris, uh, Hamas is desperate for a ceasefire, for any cessation of the uh, attack. Their leaders are sitting in the network of tunnels, uh, some of them uh, beneath hospitals, and they're sending all these messages. We want to stop the Israeli, quote, aggression, unquote. We want an end to this. We want a humanitarian pause. We want a ceasefire. The truth is that there is no difference between a ceasefire and a humanitarian pause. Uh, I don't even know where that term came up from, by the way. And I don't even know what I, it means, I, I, by the way. I, I, it's been explained that the difference between the two terms is a humanitarian ceasefire, right, means that both sides stop fighting. The The pause that's being uh, uh, um, required is that Israel stop fighting, inherently uh, uh, assuming that Hamas won't stop. They'll carry on, just we'll stop one-sidedly. The problem here is that you, there is no way of separating Hamas from the Palestinian population, from the uh, civilians because Hamas is not uh, an army that has its own bases that are located you know, outside residential areas. Hamas is inside the residential areas. Hamas is operating in the neighborhoods. Hamas is operating from buildings. Hamas is using the civilian infrastructure. So no matter what you do, any, even if it's a humanitarian pause, this will benefit Hamas. It will allow them to resupply it will allow them to regroup because it will mean some kind of a cessation you're actually saying humanitarian pause let's stop the fighting for a couple of hours what guarantees does anyone have that the humanitarian pause will not translate into a full ceasefire once you go that down that path it's very hard to stop it okay. and uh, as i said the ben- the biggest be- the uh, beneficiary of this is Hamas. I feel very sorry for the Palestinian uh, civilians over there who are paying a very heavy price. We've already seen, by the way, how Hamas has exploited uh, humanitarian pauses uh, to advance its own goals. Uh, We saw how Hamas tried to uh, uh, sneak out some of its uh, members. uh, Murdered uh, some of the injured terrorists when going out to, to Egypt. Through the Rafah. We saw that yesterday... Uh, on Saturday when Israel announced that they're allowing 
a safe passage for civilians from the north to the south, how Hamas uh, opened fire at the civilians and at the Israeli uh, army uh, over there. And, and then blamed Israel. Of course, of course. I mean, for, for, our, for our viewers Khaled, who, who haven't seen that video, we're talking about a video of a Gazan driving along and he's seeing the bodies of the, the, the Palestinians who were trying to flee southwards, who Hamas terrorists had, had literally executed on their way because they weren't remaining in Gaza as human shields uh, uh, for Hamas. If Hamas wants a humanitarian pause, it should allow all the civilians to move out of the cities, out of the battlefields, and come out and confront the Israeli army. Let it be, you know, a, a military confrontation. Don't use the civilians as hostages. Yeah. Don't, uh, uh, you know, don't put them in harm's way. And this is exactly what Hamas is doing. Uh, a humanitarian pause would also mean allowing fuel into Gaza. And what guarantees does anyone have that Hamas is not going to steal the fuel f uh, to operate or to uh, to keep its, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the clean fuel, air the and fuel, the fuel circulates the ventilation system exactly. in the tunnels, which helps them to keep exactly. on fighting. So, again, it, it, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma. But I don't see how, you know, uh, you can declare war on a terrorist organization and at the same time talk about uh, temporary ceasefires or humanitarian pauses or any kind of a pause. It doesn't work like that. So the uh, the argument should be, or the, the demand should be from Hamas. Stay away from the civilian areas. Stop uh, using uh, civilians as human shields. Stop using uh, residential areas to fire rockets at Israel, to attack Israeli soldiers. And then, you know, that that's called a humanitarian pause. The demand should be not from Israel, it should be from Hamas, by the way. Without question, what we've seen and, and what the, the IDF spokesman also uh, uh, released this morning, if, uh, uh, early, uh, earlier on today, um, was vo video footage of rocket launchers that had been dug in and placed in playgrounds, in children's playgrounds, in water parks, in schools. Really, that uh, that whole abuse of the civilian environment, as you described, Khalid, to, to, fire, to, to place their rockets, which are then fired remotely, they don't have to be there, and 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 that's the, the that's what they've been doing. Let me remind you that about a year or two years ago, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine Refugees (UNRWA) they announced that they discovered Hamas tunnels under schools, under schools in Gaza. This is not Mori saying it. It's not Khalid saying it. It's UNRWA saying it. Okay, they did not mention the name Hamas. <laughs> they said the de facto government in Gaza, but. Uh, but this is this is an indication of uh, you know how Hamas abuses human rights uh, uh, in Gaza, all these human rights violations and all that. This time, as you know, UNRWA put up a, a, a tweet relatively early into the into the fighting, um, saying that they, again the Gazan authorities had entered one of UNRWA's sites and stolen twenty four thousand liters of fuel, which was uh, deleted later. They, they deleted it two hours later. Uh, you know, un I, unbelievably, I don't blame them, uh, Maurice, because if you're sitting there with them, I mean, uh, you know, you have to be very careful. So so this is exactly the, the, the point that I would like to make uh, uh, following that. Exactly. Many of the reports, many of the arguments, many of the claims about the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Gaza are coming from organizations like UNRWA, UNICEF, all of these UN organizations who are, uh, from experience, inherently biased and and, and 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 extremely hostile even to Israel. Um, the the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs put up a, a, a video about Lynn Hastings, the the, the special coordinator of, of humanitarian affairs, who who literally has said nothing about nothing, not a word about the Israeli casualties, about the terrible massacre, about the kidnapping of or, 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 or of the hostages, nothing whatsoever. All she complains every day is about the fact that the, there's an. In, an immediate humanitarian crisis. She's been saying that for 28 days now. Um, so, 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 what is really the picture on the ground there? What's, how do we know what's going on? What's true? What isn't true? What's, what is necessary? What isn't necessary? It's very important to note that uh, there are almost no foreign journalists in Gaza. There are, I, mean, I, I, I don't know of any, but there could be, you know, only a handful. Uh, but most of the reporting coming out of Gaza is uh, you know based on 
what Palestinian journalists are saying, uh, what Hamas affiliated media outlets are reporting, and there is no way of verifying all these reports. We can't even verify the number of the casualties. Hamas is talking now about more than 9,200 uh, Palestinians killed and more than 20,000 injured. But how do we know? So Is I, there I, any way to verify it? So I was actually on a call the other day with someone who said, well, well, well the number that's coming out is from the Palestinian, the PA Ministry of of, of Health. And I said, to, but that's not true. The PA haven't been in Gaza for 16 years. The number that they use is exactly the same as the number that comes from the Hamas Ministry of Health. So it's all inherently propaganda. How can you uh, uh, even believe that? And, and 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 so that's exactly what you're saying, that, that yeah. this is the situation there. We don't really know what's going on there, how many people have been killed. Um, all of the reports that I've seen, maybe maybe you'll correct me if I'm wrong, maybe from, from, from the Palestinian side or for, from the Arabic sources, from the numbers that I've seen, there have been 9,000 civilian kills killed in Gaza, zero terrorists. Well, have you ever seen a mention of, of the number of terrorists killed in Gaza? Well, look at the pictures. We only see pictures of women and children. Without question. I mean, are there no Hamas members uh, killed? Apparently not. Apparently, every single one of the the, the people killed in Gaza was 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 that's a civilian. Why, that's why is there is there any recognition on the other side of there have been members of the so uh, so called enquiry about resistance killed? Is there any recognition of that? Is there any admission you know, of that? Maurice, that's a good question. I haven't heard yet from Hamas any announcement saying we've lost 500, 600, 700 of our fighters. All what they are reporting is children have been killed, women have been killed, journalists have been killed. Is it, Hamas not fighting in this? Uh... Israel has reported that, that, that there have been a number of even senior Hamas operatives that have been uh, um, eliminated. Yes. The, the, no, they, no, no mention whatsoever. No, when it comes to senior of, commanders, they do... Uh, that's when Publish, they talk about yes, it. That's the only time they uh, openly admit. And, you know, they announce that they have been martyred or things like that. One of them is Ayman Nofal, by the way. Yeah. One of the commanders who was killed uh, in this. But again, we have to be very, very careful when it comes to uh, reports emanating from the Gaza Strip. Because in Gaza, there is one government. It's called Hamas. Hamas controls the Ministry of Health. Hamas controls the Ministry of Finance. Hamas controls the infrastructure, the security forces and the media, more importantly. And that's why there's no way of verifying all these reports. We just have to rely on them, but we have to always make sure that we clarify that the, this is coming from Hamas. Right. And and, and so the, the, the question that, that follows on from that, Khaled, this morning uh, I was discussing with someone the idea of, uh, um, it came from, from one of the families of, of, of the kidnapped, that Israel should be doing everything it can to come to some type of a, a, a deal with Hamas, even to the extent of releasing all of the terrorists, um, just to get the uh, um, just to get the hostages back. Do you think that that's something that Hamas would entertain? Is it something that, that that Hamas is looking for? What do you think the situation of the hostages is? There's no way of telling. There's no way of telling. We don't even know how many hostages Hamas is holding, by the way, because some of the hostages. Uh are said to be held by Islamic Jihad. Other hostages are said to be held by Palestinian civilians in Gaza, those who... Some by the PFLP. The, some the, by the, the PFLP. Organized. So it's very, very difficult to tell. But Hamas has one goal, and they're saying it openly. They're saying our goal is to empty the Israeli prisons of Palestinian prisoners, so the uh, security prisoners. Uh, now, any... A prisoner deal. Where, where, where did I have to ask? Where did you see that? Because that that that's a fundamental point. But that, that's understanding. Get, if Israel agrees to that type of a, 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 a suggestion, then that means that we are giving into the demands of the terrorists. One hundred percent. First of all, I saw that in statements made by senior Hamas officials over the past few days saying there will be no release of any of the hostages unless we get all the prisoners out. And we're talking about nearly 6,000 uh, Palestinians held in Israeli prisons. Many of them and, I was involved in, in prosecuting and putting in, into jail. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think they were imprisoned for passing a red tra traffic light. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this is Hamas's stated goal. Now, I just want to uh, point out here, as in the past, any prisoner exchange 
uh, initiated by Hamas or involving Hamas will only boost Hamas's popularity among the Palestinians and it will give them more credit. So here's the dilemma that uh, if you strike such a deal with Hamas, first of all, you're negotiating with Hamas, uh, not destroying Hamas as uh, contrary to your stated goal. And number two, you are emboldening Hamas, empowering Hamas and uh, giving them more credit on the Palestinian street, and they will turn out to be the heroes who managed to release the uh, Palestinian prisoners. I mean, from that, we obviously have to, uh, to note that, that this massacre was led by, to a great extent, terrorists who had been released in, 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 the, in the, the deal to, to free Gilad Shalit, well, the Yahya leader, Sinwar. Yeah, I mean, the engineer of this whole uh, operation yeah. was uh, Yahya Sinwar, who was released in the Gilad Shalit deal. And uh, he's hiding now somewhere, uh, you know, in one of these tunnels. And, uh, you know, he, he wants to take credit for releasing the prisoners. Uh, the question is, will Israel allow that? And can you, uh, you know, find another way to release the hostages without striking such deals with the Hamas? And what do you hear from the Palestinian people in Gaza? Do they now understand, do they accept that Hamas is responsible for Probably the, 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 they're using the word Nakba again, the, 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 this other catastrophe that they use for the establishment, establishment of the state of Israel. This is the, I don't know, the second or the third Nakba. Do they understand that Hamas is responsible? You know, Maurice, I talk to many people in Gaza and I have many friends over there. And I'd like to tell you that the good news is that not all Palestinians in Gaza support Hamas. The bad, news, yeah, the bad news is that it's many, most of them. That, that, well, there are many uh, who do, on the other hand, but the bad news is that uh, many people are afraid to speak out. I mean, do you hear any voices coming out of Gaza blaming Hamas? I hear them in private, but why are people afraid to speak out? Why can't you hear these voices coming from Palestinians, even in the West Bank, by the way, saying, Hamas brought disaster on the Palestinians. Hamas is responsible for this war. Uh, you know, Hamas should not have done something like this. This is un-Islamic. It's time to condemn Hamas for the. Where, where are these voices? That's a problem that people are still afraid to speak out. And I always encourage people, you know, talk, speak out. Uh, tell me, to, say in public what you are telling me in private. That's very important. Otherwise, the world will not understand. And that's why uh, many people are convinced that everyone in Gaza supports Hamas. No, not everyone in Gaza supports Hamas. Many people do support Hamas in Gaza, but not everyone. Uh, there are people out there who are, you know, opposed to Hamas. Who, well, we need to empower them. We need to engage them. We need to encourage them to speak out. Otherwise, you know, uh, we'll just be, be stuck with this uh, whole idea. of. Uh, so, so I'm sure you... Uh... You know, also from the Palestinian Authority, from, from Mahmoud Abbas, we've seen no type of condemnation of the massacre, of uh, the terrorist attacks, of the constant fire, of the fact that, that Hamas, who really is a rival of Mahmoud Abbas, brought on this terrible uh, um, catastrophe on the people of Gaza. How do you explain that? Where where are the voices, in even in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, that are opposed to Hamas and say they shouldn't have done it? Well, Mahmoud Abbas is going around telling world leaders in private meetings that, you know, he's opposed to Hamas. Hamas does not represent the Palestinians. But again, he's afraid to speak out. Why? Why are you afraid to condemn Hamas for bringing disaster on the Palestinians in Gaza, for murdering innocent people inside Israel, for committing an atrocity? What's he afraid Why? of? You see, I'll tell you what Mahmoud Abbas is afraid of. Mahmoud Abbas has radicalized Palestinians against Israel to a point where he can no longer condemn Hamas for attacking Israel. They're just doing what he says to the Palestinians to do every day. Exactly. Mahmoud that's Abbas, the school system. That's the, the incitement. That's, that's everything that we've seen for the last 30 years. Not only that, Maurice, but Mahmoud Abbas is actually empowering Hamas and driving more Palestinians into the open arms of Hamas. How? If you incite your people against Israel and you keep telling your people Israel doesn't want peace and the Jews are bad and uh, the Jews brought the Holocaust on themselves and we and the Jews are desecrating with their filthy feet our holy sites and uh, the Jews are uh, committing war crimes and ethnic cleansing and apartheid, what are you doing? 
you are driving Palestinians into the open arms of Hamas. The demonizing Israelis to the point where the natural cause of what you said and told them to do is to go out and massacre people. Absolutely, absolutely. It was Mahmoud Abbas, by the way, who in 1995 openly stated, uh, we will not allow Jews uh, to defile with their filthy feet our holy sites. And immediately after that statement, the knife intifada erupted. And if you look at this Hamas... 95, 2015. Sorry, in 2015, yes. Uh, and if you look at this Hamas massacre, what's the name of the massacre? The, the, the name Al chosen... The Al-Aqsa Al Flood. Al-Aqsa Flood. The operation to, quote-unquote, defend Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, against attacks by Jews. That's why I keep saying that incitement and indoctrination and the delegitimization of Israel plays into the hands of Hamas. So Mahmoud Abbas, <clears throat> sorry, can no longer condemn Hamas because Palestinians will tell him, but you were telling us the same thing. You were telling us that the Jews are desecrating with their filthy feet our holy sites and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Church of the, uh, the Holy, Sepulchre. holy Sepulchre and things like that. So Mahmoud Abbas, on the one hand, can no longer uh, condemn Hamas. On the other hand, he's also afraid of his own people. He's afraid that the, the, they will shoot him for being too moderate. Uh, that for, he now cannot stand up and say yes. this is unacceptable as this, this is, is not the Palestinian way. Exactly, exactly. Th that's why Palestinians need a, a courageous leader, a leader who can stand up and say, folks, this is bad. We need to think of a new direction. We cannot continue in this course. We are bringing one disaster, one Nakba after the other on our people. I still don't hear that voice. The only statements you get out of Ramallah are condemnation of Israel, accusations of Israel. Israel is doing one, two, three. Okay, is there no Palestinian responsibility? Apparently not. Apparently the, the Palestinians can do uh, basically whatever they want and there's no, and they can hide behind this uh, this claim of, well, we're afraid. But Abbas has, who does Abbas have to be afraid of apart from maybe his own people because he's radicalized them so much that they exactly. will kill him? Are there no other let's say, top or middle top to top Palestinian leaders who, who have come out and said anything? I follow the statements every day. There's nothing, right? I even call some Palestinian officials and ask them, you know, if they're willing to speak out uh, or say anything. And they, they all tell me, the, no comment, no comment, no thank you. The, 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 there's all the people that the, the, the different, uh, um, the, the different people are touting as potential uh, um, replacements for Abbas um, should he be incapable of carrying out his his, his duties anymore? Um, no, no comment. Jibril Rajub. Jibril uh, um, uh, Rajub has disappeared. Majid Farah. Jibril Rajub has dis yeah. disappeared. Yeah, he's not he's not commenting at all. Hussein Sheikh is making statements, but only once condemning Israel and accusing Israel of ethnic cleansing and apartheid and displacement. And well, they were, we're used to these statements. And, and Majid Faraj, who, uh, who is continuing on allegedly with the, yeah. the security coordination Majid. with Israel, he, he, he also didn't know anything about the, the impending attack. He has no, no ability to do anything in, in, in Gaza. You know, He's the head of the Palestinian security forces. You know, Majid Faraj was himself targeted by Hamas when he went to visit with Rami Hamdala. Exactly, you remember. In 2000 and, and they, 2012. They tried to kill him at the entrance to Gaza. Yeah, they, they, with they, the roadside they, bomb. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, they're good at condemning Hamas when Hamas kills them or attacks them or tries to kill them. But when it comes to murdering Jews, they're, they're silent. So where's leadership? Why, do, you know, what are you doing to help the people in Gaza? What have you done over the past 10, 15 years? It was President Mahmoud Abbas who imposed economic sanctions on Gaza, by the way. That was in 2018. In, in 2018, Mahmoud Abbas, just uh, uh, for our viewers, just uh, as a reminder, um, Mahmoud Abbas was annoyed with, uh, uh, um, the, with uh, uh, Hamas for not coming to reconciliation, he called it, um, where everyone, all of the Palestinian uh, factions, as, as they're referred to, um, would come under the same umbrella of leadership. And so he, he imposed a number of uh, um, different uh, sanctions on Gaza, all running up to before the, the March of Return, including he refused to pay the electricity, electricity bill. Yes. Yes. And, and it cut down the, the electricity in Gaza from 12 hours a day to four hours a day. 
what now everyone is complaining, and, well, this is the terrible humanitarian crisis. Mahmoud Abbas did exactly the same and worse in 2018. And he suspended payments to tens of thousands of impoverished families in the Gaza Strip. 70,000 uh, of the needy Palestinians were punished by Mahmoud Abbas. That was yeah, the number that, yeah. that so, was given at the time. Uh, um, employees this is of the collective PIA. punishment. This is a collective punishment. And this is the same Mahmoud Abbas who accuses Israel of imposing collective punishment on Gaza. So l l I, we have to get back to, 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 to Hamas because we have to try and understand uh, uh, as part of moving this conflict forward and moving the war forward, we have to try and, I think, identify what Hamas's goals are. And by identifying their goals, we can also know how to how Israel needs to act and behave in order not to support those goals. So one of the goals, I think, is, uh, as you mentioned before, is release of all of the, 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 the prisoners. How do we nonetheless support the innocent Palestinian people, on the one hand, but without giving into or supporting any of the goals of Hamas? For example, fuel. Fuel is a critical uh, uh, um, uh, element that Hamas needs to forward its, uh, its warfare. But it's also something which is needed to to run the hospitals. How do we balance that 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 whole equation? I think there needs to be some kind of a mechanism. We need to you know devise some kind of a mechanism that will allow uh, humanitarian aid and fuel to go to the citizens without ending up in the hands of Hamas. And I really don't know how that can be done. Probably I, I don't know if the UN can be trusted to do that or some international organization. But it's a dilemma. It's a big dilemma. As long as Hamas is strong and controlling uh, large parts of Gaza, even if you send food into Gaza, that will benefit Hamas. Uh, we're not even yeah. talking about the uh, the fuel. So it's a dilemma. And there needs to be some kind of an international arrangement or something because the poor people in Gaza are paying a very heavy price. There are hundreds of thousands of people who have been displaced. They're, they've been left without water, without electricity. And Hamas does not care about them. Hamas uh, leaders. We saw, we saw the video of, of Musa Abu Marzouk saying when he was asked, well, why don't you let the civilians hide in the, the, the tunnels that, that, that Hamas has built? And he said, we don't care. The tunnels are there to protect the resistance. 75% of the population are refugees. And that's the international community's problem. That was his response. Yahya Sinwar and Muhammad Def, the local leaders of Hamas in Gaza, are hiding in their uh, tunnels, in their luxurious tunnels, I would call them. And the political leadership of Hamas, Khalid Mash'al, Ismail Haniya, Ghazi Hamad, Khalil al Hayya, and all these guys, where are they? They're in Qatar, they are in Lebanon, some of them are in Turkey, and they're traveling around. They all left Gaza a few years ago. Razi Hamad left, uh, left, left two months ago. Do you think he left because he knew what was coming? No, no, these are people who are searching for a good life. They're just going for a good yeah, life, that's yeah, it. Yeah, they moved with their families. Ismail Haniya moved in 2020. Uh, Khalid Mash'al, uh, oh, sorry, Khalid Mash'al has always been abroad, but Khalil Al-Hayya joined him, uh, Mushir Al-Masri, uh, Abu Zuhri, uh, Sami Abu Zuhri. Uh, you know, you search for Hamas political leaders in Gaza, you don't find them. Explain to me, if you can, Khalid, What's going on with Egypt? Why are Egypt so uh, adamant not to help even temporarily the, the Palestinians who are trying to flee? Where's that? Where's that? The, the term that we hear all the time is the Arab Brotherhood. Arab solidarity. The Arab solidarity. Where is that solidarity now? Well, you know, the irony, Maurice, is that they're saying we're helping you by keeping you there. Because if we allow you in, we're helping Israel displace you. We don't want to turn you into refugees. So stay there and die there. Just don't come to Sinai. Don't come to Jordan. We don't want to... I mean, you know, this is hypocrisy. Hypo it's the, it's the uh, culmination of hypocrisy, by the way. And the international community is not calling these people out, these Arab leaders. What's preventing CC from opening the border and taking 50,000, 20,000 people you know what? Temporarily, we're not asking him to turn them to turn him to turn to turn these Palestinians into Egyptian citizens, uh, even though they should have been Egyptian citizens. That's another issue. From forty-eight to sixty-seven, when yeah. Egypt uh, uh, controlled the Gaza Strip, they could have been a Egyptian me, citizens. With the exception of Jordan, which Arab country 
gives Palestinian citizenship. None of them, right? Yeah. In Lebanon, they're not given citizenship. They're they're banned from not only are from, they from, not... from a couple of hundred different pro uh, 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 professions in Syria. In Syria, were they not given a, a citizenship of some kind? No, no. They uh, were just killed by Assad, and that was it. They were slaughtered at the Yarmouk uh, camp. Uh, they were displaced. Uh, you know, Assad. First of all, Assad's father slaughtered Palestinians in in Lebanon. Then the son slaughtered Palestinians in uh, Syria. We saw what happened in uh, Jordan in Black September 1970 when they went after the PLO. The Egyptians don't want to see the Palestinians. Uh, the Kuwaitis deported more than 400,000 Palestinians uh, in 1992 or 1991 after Kuwait was liberated from the Iraqi invasion. Uh, the Arab world has actually turned its back on the Palestinians and the Palestinians know that. And they even look today at the Arab world and its reactions to the uh, war. And they know that the Arabs don't really care. Other than lip service and statements of uh, condemnation, the Arabs are not really uh, going to come to the rescue of the Palestinians because the Arabs see the Palestinians as being ungrateful, as stab having stabbed them in the back, as uh, holding the Arab world hostage uh, to their, you know, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Arab world has been saying, we want to move on you Palestinians are not you can't even hold elections you can't even uh, elect new leaders you can't uh, even get your act together you are divided into two separate entities one in Gaza and one in the West Bank so the Arab world doesn't really care and as I said the in most Arab countries Palestinians are subjected to apartheid and discriminatory laws and regulations that even prevent them from purchasing houses or sending their children to the same school as Arab nationals uh, and, you know, this is really, uh, uh, you know, it's really uh, enraging. It's, uh, it's, it's sad also. It's tragic for the Palestinians that wherever they go, the Arabs uh, slam the doors in front of them. So, so one of the questions from, from, uh, uh, from our, our viewers from, from Lee's calls, uh, it's really, uh, it's a great question. To what extent, since we, we understand that Hamas cannot be the leadership and they will be obliterated, that's a, a stated goal of the war. Mahmoud Abbas, as you so clearly uh, uh, um, spelled out, isn't really isn't fit to be the, ne the uh, a leader of the Palestinians, not in the West Bank, not in Jordan Samaria, and certainly not going back to Gaza, where the PA was already in charge for 10 years. They brought us on uh, um, to the, the, the rise of Hamas. To what extent... Could Israeli Arab leaders fill in that leadership vacuum? People like Mansour Abbas, who was a who was almost as as close as could be a a, 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 mem a, a definitely a mem member of the government, a member of the coalition government, almost to the extent of being a minister in the previous uh, uh, government. To what extent could an, an Israeli Arab uh, um, be or fill that that leadership vacuum? Well, first of all, I don't understand why should an Israeli Arab citizen uh, go and become a Palestinian leader? I'm not even sure they want that, by the way. Uh, the Arabs inside Israel are Israeli citizens. They want to run for the Knesset. They want to be part of Israel. They are fighting for integration, not separation from Israel. Uh, number two, people like Mansour Abbas, the head of the uh, United Arab uh, List, is considered too moderate. So or, someone like Ahmed Tibi, Ahmed Tibi touts constantly his connections to the Palestinians, calls himself a Palestinian, uh, um, was Yasser Arafat's close advisor. Do you think he would be interested in being the next Palestinian leader? Why don't we ask him? I think that should him. be a question that, yeah. that, that, that that's put out there. We should ask him if he wants Maybe to. Maybe that's something he, he could... would have to give up his Israeli citizenship, and I'm not sure, you know. That's something easy to do. You don't think he would he, he would be willing to give that up to be uh, the next Palestinian leader that he considers himself to be a Palestinian for all uh, intents and purposes? Well, although Israeli Arabs or many of them, people like uh, Ahmad Tibi, call themselves you know Palestinian citizens of Israel and all that, but when it comes to uh, making the separation between the Israeli Arabs, uh, or when it comes to asking Israeli Arabs to assume responsibility. And uh, move on, you know, or move to the other side. They say, no, 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 stop here. We are part of Israel. Those are our families, but you know, yeah. they are separate from us.
politically so, and physically. So really, at the moment, we are in quite a dilemma as to what's going to happen both in in Gaza with that, that whole vacuum that's that's going to be created there, um, in Judea and Samaria, the same thing in the West Bank, with that whole leadership vacuum that, that that's impending. Mahmoud Abbas is, I think it's it's his birthday in, 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 in a few days' time. I think the 15th of November, he'll be turning 89. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so what, what are we going to do on, on, on that front as well, where, where we're seeing that there's no, there's no real there's daylight, the there's no real daylight between Hamas and, 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 and the PA, the so-called moderates. So, so, so how do you, you know, the biggest... I, 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 I'm going to ask you to try and do something, which I, which I understand is, is almost uh, impossible. How do you explain, for example, Anthony Blinken, the, 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 the U S secretary of state, coming again and saying well we have to support the palestinian authority does he not see what you're what you're so clearly seeing about the palestinian leadership well i mean uh, you know the us administration and other western countries they say well the, the, the palestinian authority is the lesser of the evils you know all, first of all they're good because they're not hamas that's that's where it starts from in, in their view but they do not listen to what the palestinian authority says in arabic and they, don't, they do not listen to some, or they do not watch some of the actions of the Palestinian Authority on the ground, which are very similar to, uh, you know, to Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And that's why they assume that the Palestinian Authority are the good guys and Hamas are the bad guys. The truth is that when you listen to the rhetoric of the Palestinian Authority, it's not much different than the rhetoric of uh, Hamas. And I advise you to go and watch Palestine TV out of Ramallah and watch Palestinian stations uh, broadcasting from Gaza, you will see that they're using the same terminology and the same rhetoric and the same messaging, by the way. Unfortunately, on that, uh, a very pessimistic note, I think we're going to wrap it up for today, Khalid. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you um, and for and for helping uh, uh, um, spread that message and, and, and explain to our viewers actually Maurice, what's going wanted on. wanted Palestinian leaders, good Palestinian leaders. That should be a big sign. Not because... Wanted. One Palestinian, yes. Palestinian leaders. Not because of Israel, because of for the for the sake of the Palestinians. Without question. That's uh, I think that the call needs to come out. Finding those Palestinian leaders who are truly interested in the best interests of their own people, whilst at the same time not calling for the destruction of Israel and recognizing that the Jewish country is 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 here to stay uh, um and is an integral part of the Middle East. We are uh, uh, um, part of this, uh, uh, the, the fabric of the area, and have been for uh, uh, many, many uh, um, thousands of years. Um, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be back again tomorrow at four o'clock Israel time. I know we've, I apologize that we missed you on, on Friday, that we had a few technical uh, uh, um, issues and the, the, some of the time changes in the different zones. We've now got over that. We're back on our, on our uh, daylight not daylight saving time and America is on no not daylight saving time there as well um and so we should be back to that seven hour gap four o'clock Israel time nine o'clock in the morning uh, Eastern Standard Time and uh, unfortunately a little bit earlier on the west coast um please join us again thank you very much have a good day